I'm Dr. Sincorrigible, songstress for Graduates Rise. I'm here to make you think about your role as a member of the human race. This recorded lecture grows out of a presentation I made during the 2021 annual program meeting of the Council on Social Work Education held in Orlando, Florida. It is created for social workers and for social science practitioners in general that want to push beyond the traditional binary relationship between individual and collective. Specifically, we will examine Dr. Hans Falk's membership perspective proposed in 1988 as an alternative to the dual model of social work. We are also going to use Graduates Rise's music video for Quarantine Not Quarantined, which was inspired by the membership perspective in the age of COVID-19. Our learning objectives are designed to assess holistic competence as aligned with the Council on Social Work Education's educational policy and accreditation standards. The membership perspective offers us a new way of conceptualizing diversity, which many of us believe, myself included, that we very much need new and more equitable ways for social scientists to develop and evaluate practices designed to change human beings. This recorded lecture has an accompanying learning guide available for free on the Graduates Rise website at www.graduatesrise.com. If you are a professor, these resources are designed to make it easy for you to add this content to your course syllabi. If your group uses this module in any way, please let me know. You can find at Graduates Rise on major social media and music streaming platforms. Please follow our pages for updates and let us know if there are any conclusions you may come to about the usefulness of the membership perspective for social work and beyond. If you engage with the full module, participants should be able to demonstrate holistic competence through knowledge by describing the core concepts of the membership perspective, using skills in differentiating between the membership perspective and the dual model of social work, through cognitive and affective processes required to compare and contrast hypothetical COVID response approaches, and finally, the ability to exercise judgment for practice in articulating how adopting the membership perspective might alter one's COVID response approach and or their impact as a member of the human race. Just a little bit about who I am before we get into the lesson. I was born on Nashville, Tennessee's world famous rock block at the tail end of Generation X. I grew up primarily in a single mother-led household that relied on public assistance to get by. I identify as non-binary femme and my pronouns are she, they. I manage disabilities that are mostly invisible to others, but they impact almost everything that I do. I was able to leverage my assets and a great deal of student loans in order to be the first person in my family to obtain an undergraduate degree and I went on to complete a master's degree in social work and a doctorate of philosophy or a PhD in social work. Like many low-income Americans, my educational journey was not easy. It often felt like I was somewhere I could not afford to be and that the systems of higher education were determined to keep me from infiltrating the academy. Nonetheless, I persisted. I did end up selling almost everything that I owned to live out of my car for the last year of my doctoral studies. Now, do not feel too sorry for me just yet because I was quite good at being homeless by this time in my life and I was able to utilize my many privileges and charms to protect my most prized possessions and to stay with friends, couch surf, or house sit so that I did not spend very many nights outside. That does not make what I went through okay, but that is not the focus of this video. What this time in my life did do was to help me learn new ways to rely on others for survival, and I allowed this to change me for the better. While staying with my friend Gray Jacks, whose solo work you can check out at www.thegraya.com, Gray saw the poems I had been writing to cope throughout my PhD program, and he says, Sin, this needs to be an album. I was reluctant at first, but Gray was such a talented musician, there was no way I could refuse once he offered to be my instrument and compose music to make a record. This effort resulted in Math is Hard, Graduates Rise's debut album, which was released in May of 2016, the same day I defended my doctoral dissertation. Graduates Rise continues to exist as a critical outlet for my own self-care, and it provides me an opportunity to educate and contribute to the social discourse for change in my own unique way. Which educating with uniqueness brings me to Dr. Hans Falk and the membership perspective. 
Dr. Falk passed away in 2014, a recognized social work pioneer. He was born in Germany in 1923 and escaped just before the border was closed to Jewish families in 1939. He served in the U.S. Army during the 1940s and then went on to receive multiple degrees, including a Master of Social Work and a Ph.D. I originally heard about Dr. Falk while I was a student at Virginia Commonwealth University, or VCU, in Richmond, Virginia, where Dr. Falk was a professor emeritus. I have always been interested in community change, so when I read about his work on membership, I eagerly went to check out a copy of his Springer series on social work, The Membership Perspective, from VCU's library. I read it all in one sitting, after which I could not understand why this model was not talked about more. I asked around VCU and several of my professors who personally knew Dr. Falk told me stories of how the membership perspective was all the rage in the 1990s and how everyone talked about it and just knew that this would fundamentally change social work forever. Except that it didn't. Or at least it hasn't yet. Which is why I'm here talking to you about this. Dr. Falk said his work was largely motivated by the Hebrew phrase tikkun ulam, or repair the world. While I am not Jewish, or particularly religious at all, making the world a better place by helping each other is an idea that I can get behind. The membership perspective is about defining what it means to be a human. It is not about capitalism versus communism. Those are economic systems. It is not about Republicans versus Democrats. Those are political systems. This is about control of how humans define what it means to be human. This requires self-control over our own behaviors and control over the mechanisms of controlling other people's behavior. Who is in control of these controls? Who and or what is in control of what it means to be a member of the human race? And more importantly, how can these controls be used to repair the world and not just survive at the expense of others? Spoiler alert! The membership perspective says that membership is the irreducible state of human life. Not an individual and not the collective, but instead human existence is the perpetual balancing act of membership. Back to reality. It's March 2020 and the start of the COVID pandemic. Being a justice-oriented behavior scientist, I was able to recognize early on that America's over-reliance on the notion of the individual was likely to have a negative impact on public health during the pandemic. I thought about all of the social workers and all of the other essential workers that were going to have to take risks to protect our collective well-being through this time. I thought about the individuals that were going to struggle more due to their personal health risks and or their lack of resources to help them weather the storm. And I thought about those who would get sick and die. It's so hard to engage in coordinated public health action when so many individuals are systemically marginalized from basic social supports on a daily basis already. Then I thought about the membership perspective and how our COVID response might be different if humans were taught to believe that membership were the irreducible state of human existence and that we were all in this together and that we all actually needed each other to survive. Being a daughter of Athena, a Nashvilleian, and the songstress for a punk band, I put my thoughts into lyrics. I worked remotely with Gray to compose the music, and once travel and small gatherings became safe, we assembled a great team of talented artists to create the song and video, and Quarantine Not Quarantined by Graduates Rise was born. As we watch the video together, think about how many social science theories are portrayed throughout the story. There's also a VCU logo from my PhD alma mater in there. Can you find it?
I hope you enjoyed that. As you watched, which social science theories did you detect? Some of the primary theories motivating me include the strengths perspective, where social workers choose to focus on people's strengths rather than their weaknesses, the prevention paradox, which helps to explain how long-term population level health strategies like wearing seat belts, avoiding fatty foods, or mask wearing may not always feel beneficial to individuals in the short term, but how they always reduce statistical risk in the population as a whole over the long term. And then Kohlberg's stages of moral development. This helps us to understand how people grow and learn in deciding to do the right thing or not with fear being the original motivator, followed by self-interest and wanting to be perceived as good, then the motivation becomes to fit in with peer groups, which can evolve into an authentic respect for population level social contracts, and ultimately, Kohlberg's most advanced stage of moral development occurs when compassion for others governs all decision making. You may also consider which of social work's six core values were most prominently portrayed in the video. These core values include service, social justice, dignity and worth of the person, the importance of human relationships, integrity, and competence. Given the divisiveness in today's world, I want to focus in on how we balance respecting the dignity and worth of each individual person while considering new conceptualizations of exactly how important human relationships really are. The membership perspective serves as a holistic approach to understanding individualism and collectivism through membership, defined as the irreducible state of human life. Social work has struggled over time to build its own identity as a specialized form of practice. Part of how we define our discipline is through the theory base that guides our practice. Chapter one of Dr. Falk's Membership Perspective book provides a literature review of how the discipline has viewed individuals and groups over time. Historically, social work needed to be able to differentiate individuals from groups, to be able to focus on the unique needs of each individual human being. At the time, this was what was needed and Falk argues that in order to accomplish this, social work split the human from its group so it could be studied as an individual. And then social work further split each person into biopsychosocial pieces so that each piece could be studied and treated. Falk defines this split using five postulates that we believe about individuals that he says are a function of the splitting and not a function of innate human nature. The split impacted our feelings about separateness, independence, self-attribution, distinctiveness, and freedom. Separateness is the belief that unique human beings are entitled to their individual desired satisfactions. Are we entitled to our own unique satisfactions or do we need to be able to reconcile these with other group members? Independence or self-determination is seen as the highest level of human behavior. Is self-determination tops? Sometimes authentically supporting your group may be more important than exercising your own personal desires. With self-attribution, consequences in individuals' relationships are attributed to the self rather than seen as reciprocal. Social workers often tell clients to focus on what you can control, meaning their own personal behavior. But how can we do this without defaulting to thinking that we are the center of the universe? The need for distinctiveness is also postulated as a function of the split in that humans currently define their identity by what distinguishes them from other people. However, in reality, their relationships also define them. And finally, perhaps the most impactful during a pandemic, the way we conceptualize freedom. In a world where individualism takes primacy, People define themselves as free by the degree to which they make decisions leading to maximum benefit to the self. Is freedom all about self-interest or is this an impact of the split? Dr. Falk argues that the dual model of social work serves to maintain this split and to justify its continued existence. This dual perspective has allowed us to focus on the needs of vulnerable groups 
and create systems of evidence-based practice. But most social workers still feel like something is not quite right. Vulnerable groups continue to suffer. The gap between rich and poor continues to widen. And we must ask ourselves exactly whose evidence is guiding our practice decisions and why. Dr. Falk defines attempts to repair the split through conceptual abstractions to include addition, hyphenation, mediation, and the parts whole approach. Addition recognizes the individual as the irreducible unit of human life, but combines it with another individual or a group of individuals. For example, the individual and their partner or the individual and the group. Hyphenation is a form of addition that keeps the person first, but uses hyphens to repair the split, such as person in situation or person in environment. Mediation is not additive, recognizing that what is split can never be fully repaired. However, bridges or other conceptual structures can be created between multiple components to accomplish a level of wholeness. And finally, the parts whole method, which Falk argues is implicit in modern day thinking so that most do not even detect its influence on our lives. Similar to addition, the parts whole approach seeks to disassemble and assemble pieces so that intervention becomes possible. However, parts whole insists that integration of the parts is inevitable and that as one part of a system changes, so too will all of its parts be changed in some way. But we do not have good ways of measuring any of these fixes as they are all conceptual, subjective processes. Where this leaves social science is super frustrated with people fighting over pieces of arguments about binary extremes that have become backed into dogmatic political corners. Some of these old binary debates that continue to haunt the human race to this day include, should we expect people to be completely self-sufficient or should we build in systems of guaranteed social support? If people cannot support themselves, do we see them as deserving poor or non-deserving poor? Are the poor suffering from a personal failure or a system failure? Should we seek to change the individual or should we change the community? Should we focus on crisis response or prevention? These debates have become so entrenched in protecting the idea of the supremacy of individualism that we risk end up getting frozen in time and unable to protect ourselves from the ever-changing environment that increasingly requires us to depend on others for survival. While binary extremes are useful for math, we have to recognize that we only make endpoints and turn these concepts into bipolar opposites when we need to use them as latent constructs, typically meaning something is about to be measured for research in order to describe, explain, predict, and or control whatever is being studied. This does not make binaries inherently bad, but it does make them artificial by default, which is something social workers need to be aware of as we use social science research to guide our practice. Now for the core concepts of the membership perspective. In chapter two, Dr. Falk defines membership through the lens of boundaries, which denote where one thing ends and another thing begins. The membership perspective does protect the notion of the individual, but it includes the influence of others by defining each entity as a member rather than an individual. This is not just a semantic change. To truly adopt the membership perspective, you need to change the way you conceptualize the individual. Specifically, Falk defines member as a physical being bound by semi-permeable membranes and cavities, a social being in continuous interaction with others who are both seen and unseen, and as a psychological being capable of private experience. Things that can be inferred from humans about membership include a member's actions are socially derived and contributory, meaning nothing that we do happens in isolation. The identity of each member is bound up with that of others through social involvement, meaning that it is critically important that our internal identities are aligned with external perceptions of who we are. Thus, it is fundamental that everyone's identity needs space to develop. Because a member is a person whose differences from others creates tensions, and these tensions lead to growth through group conflict and cohesion, members need to be able to communicate and process information freely, which brings us to freedom. 
Within the individualistic dual model of social work, freedom meant the degree to which a person is able to make self-determined decisions leading to maximum benefit to themselves. Through the lens of the membership perspective, human freedom is defined by simultaneous concern for oneself and others. Freedom becomes about equity and making sure that everyone's self-interest is realized. Dr. Falk further depicted the membership grid as the combined space occupied by all members. All members exist in membership through the membership grid and are governed by two boundary principles, constant connectedness and conditional accessibility. Constant connectedness holds that all components are permanently linked by virtue of common need, function, and prerequisites for survival. Membership is permanent and cannot be reversed. Relationships are not external to the person, but denote permanence in time, meaning, and process. This means that you are permanently changed by those you are in membership with, and they are permanently changed by you. Conditional accessibility serves to explain the nature of access from one member to another as subject to specifiable conditions or selectivity. Access is governed by rules that are both facilitative and restrictive and can be thought of as either physical, likened to the cells in a human body, or structural, such as social interaction within social systems, or otherwise functioning in a non-physical sense, such as through social norms, trends, or generational patterns. When looking through the lens of the membership perspective, we are all always connected in some way, and the role of social work becomes to support healthy boundary establishment and management. For social workers, a theory is only as good as it is useful in guiding practice decisions. To help us think about boundaries and boundary management, Dr. Falk presents four human functions to describe the analytic power of the two boundary principles of membership. Each of these functions was selected due to its ability to be empirically observed without splitting the human under observation. These are membership in biology to help us understand physical functioning in that our individual organs are always connected but still performing unique tasks. Membership as a social process which helps us understand the interactions between humans and how some memberships can be positive, negative, or ambiguous. Membership is meaning to describe how we create and use symbols in monitoring society to guide inclusion and exclusion from groups. And membership in intrapsychic processes, which is about how we manage our cognitive dissonance as we make our desires known in the world, internalize the external world, and as we come to understand how important it is for members to feel their internal beliefs affirmed by external members. Dr. Falk did not specify membership in particle physics, but I believe this dimension to also be a core function distinct from the others where we might empirically observe how humans are connected to other humans through membership. When you consider elementary particles and the central forces of the universe, we all exist in membership with animals and the physical world all around us. While it is not the purpose of this video for me to fully explicate this proposed function of membership, I will note that part of why I think the membership perspective is important is because I believe it has the potential to serve as a bridge between social science, physical science, and quantum science. But since he was writing in the 1980s and 90s, Dr. Fogg did not discuss quantum science and instead used the rest of his book to discuss how the membership perspective would impact social work practice at the individual, group, and community levels. Primary social work tasks would be centered on boundary management and ensuring boundaries serve to maintain life. Tasks that people might need help with include monitoring of boundaries, clarification of the conditions of accessibility between boundaries, confrontation to protect members if a boundary is damaged, counseling to promote member development, facilitation of interactions, options identification and supported choice, and supported interpretation of the meanings of interaction and relationships with other members. There are scholarly sources that discuss the membership perspective, but it has yet to be widely adopted into social work curriculum or practice as a core theory. 
Even at VCU, where Dr. Falk was a professor emeritus, the membership perspective was not a component of any of my core courses. I found out about him while researching a scholarship that VCU awards each year in his name. I cannot tell you exactly why this is, but I expect it is because the Western world is not quite ready to surrender the primacy of rugged individualism. But I am, and I still think about membership perspective all the time and how different our world might be if we all agreed that we were all intrinsically in this together and our survival is bound up in each other's survival. Which brings me back to how the membership perspective inspired me to write Quarantine Not Quarantined. I'm going to discuss each of these human functions of membership to help clarify what Dr. Falk meant in creating each category, and then I will compare and contrast pandemic behaviors in the current individualistic model versus a hypothetical world viewed through membership. Membership in biology is about our physical functioning. The membership perspective sees all of our body parts and all of our body behaviors as being in a state of constant connectedness. They are interlinked, both directly and indirectly, as one part would not function the same way without the others. Conditional accessibility creates the semi-permeable, permeable and non-permeable boundaries that serve to maintain life. Think about all of the different organs that make up a human, and then all of the humans that make up a family, the families that comprise a country, then all of the countries that make up the world. These are all enforced by boundaries, some natural and some constructed. Boundaries control physical functioning and well-being. Our biological connectedness becomes easy to understand during a pandemic as we all obsess over the spread of microscopic viruses from person to person. Through today's lens of political stonewalls and rugged individualism, People that are at an increased risk for serious illness or death from COVID, such as people with diabetes or immune system conditions, are responsible for managing their own needs and protecting themselves. People that are essential workers may feel forced to be in workplaces that are not safe in order to provide for their families. And people that do not understand or trust healthcare services feel coerced into being vaccinated against their will. In a world where people struggle on a daily basis, for equitable access to essential services like food, housing, information, and health care, it becomes easy to question system motives. If we looked at the world through the lens of membership, we would not find ourselves in this predicament as all members would have access to basic life needs by virtue of being a member of the human race. If people had this level of support from society, one's personal freedom would not be threatened by engaging in collective behaviors like mask wearing or social distancing. These instead would be opportunities to demonstrate community care. Membership also functions through social processes. Our survival depends on human interaction, both verbal and nonverbal. Humans originally came together in groups to help coordinate food, water, and safety. These needs still exist but the connections that exist between humans are selective, which can create both positive and negative impacts in a human's life. In today's world where people struggle for control over their lives and their personal boundaries, it is no wonder that collective trust is strained. Many of the social rules that govern human interaction are changed out of necessity during a pandemic. These are scary times and people that are afraid will often surrender their rights for even an illusion of safety. If the world viewed our individual health status as intrinsically connected to the health status of others through membership, washing your hands, wearing face masks, and being upfront and honest about contact tracing would be automatic behaviors, not foreign concepts that feel like an affront to one's personal freedoms. We would understand that interaction requires that we respect each other's boundaries, which is needed for collective survival. How we perceive interactions functions as membership and meaning. This is how we create symbols to enhance communication between members. Symbolization is both constant and selective at the same time, and the meanings humans attach to symbols function primarily through monitoring behavior, where one may monitor the significance of their own behaviors, or one might monitor the behaviors of other group members. Inclusion or exclusion based on monitoring is important and leads to how one interprets the content of human interaction as positive or negative. 
In today's world of individualistic power, it's all too often the rich and powerful that control which symbols are used to communicate which meanings. In a world where people are under surveillance by the powerful primarily so we can be typecast for targeted advertising campaigns or to have our rights to vote manipulated by internet trolls, it's no wonder there is resistance to any form of monitoring. The membership perspective would take into account power differentials between members and who gets to maintain and enforce what symbols mean and who gets to monitor whom. In a pandemic, masks become important symbols of community care. Given that most humans agree wearing masks all day can be difficult and uncomfortable, we are all eager to transition away from masks, but we can't safely do this until we have accomplished enough community level immunity to stop the virus from continuing to spread and mutate. Vaccines present this option, however, not everyone agrees on which vaccines are safe for whom or on what it means to be fully vaccinated. And not everyone agrees on procedures for monitoring vaccination status, nor about who gets included or excluded based on mask wearing compliance or vaccination status. Perspectives are all wrapped up in politics right now, and there are many conflicting decisions coming out of state and federal courts, and a lot of it has to do with the Americans with Disabilities Act. As a PhD level social worker and a person with disabilities that requires accommodations to get through life, let me tell you what the ADA says and what it does not say. It says people with disabilities get reasonable accommodations to guarantee equal access to public spaces. The ADA does not allow people with disabilities to do whatever they want in public spaces, and it especially does not allow people with disabilities to endanger others in the act of securing reasonable accommodations for themselves. Part of the original discussion when the ADA was being passed was about movie theaters and whether or not a person sitting in a wheelchair had a right to block an aisleway or a doorway. The answer was emphatically no. The person in the wheelchair does not have the right to endanger everyone else in the theater by blocking an exit, no matter how severe or profound their disability may be. What this meant was that the movie theaters had to come up with another solution, which most modified their seating to create a safe space for people in wheelchairs to be while enjoying a film that did not block exits or walkways. We are having the collective discussion right now in our organizations and courts to decide which groups get which kind of protections under the ADA and other laws during a pandemic and what kind of leeway organizations and governments may have in requiring compliance with public health procedures, along with who gets to monitor whom and how, and ultimately which people will be included or excluded from public spaces, people that refuse to get vaccinated or people with underlying health risks. Which leads us to Dr. Falk's final category, membership and intrapsychic processes. This function governs how objects relate in the external world and how this forms the bridge between external and internal reality for each member. The meanings behind membership create intrapsychic beliefs that impact how a person expresses and receives membership. For a healthy society, it is of critical importance that internalizations support healthy personality development for each member. In a world where people are implicitly pitted against each other through grand binaries like black versus white, young versus old, or male versus female, it is no wonder that we have become separated into dogmatic bipolar opposites. In a pandemic, intrapsychic processes are fueled by negative emotions like worry, guilt, fear, doubt, anger, and grief. Is this human nature or is this a function of the split? If we valued membership more, we would be looking at stress management through a critical lens. So many people are experiencing multiple traumas simultaneously, and we must be sensitive to this. Even for those that may hold negative views of vaccination, they are members too, and they are also stressed and acting under the influence of negative emotions. While I do support maintaining rigid physical boundaries to prevent the spread of the virus, we also still need to care about each other emotionally. Regardless of your access to or beliefs about vaccinations, we are all members of the same human race and it is very important that we all remember this as we move forward through time. So can people change? Sure we can. 
These are developmental theories because they are explaining human development and change is inevitable. So here is my message to help promote human development towards membership in a pandemic. Trauma is a negative function of membership and does damage to your biological and intrapsychic boundaries. During persistent trauma, one must be vigilant in choosing resilience every day. Without excusing or justifying the trauma, one must embrace it so that it can be controlled, split off for study, and treated. The best advice I can give as we navigate our responsibilities as members in a world that rewards the primacy of the individual is to always be confident and firm about the boundaries you need to maintain your personal safety. But balance this with understanding and being as flexible as possible with others. Each of us should try to demonstrate self-care and self-help while also doing our best to ensure that others are able to engage in self-care and self-help. We should strive to use hope-filled language, even when we're being explicitly critical. We should seek to create community whenever we can, and we should ask people what they need instead of assuming we already know. And in general, we need to help people feel the power and safety that comes from membership, while never compromising their individual boundaries. This is no easy task, and during a pandemic, no less. But what this looks like is making sure it is a top priority for everyone in the globe to get vaccinated unless their doctor says otherwise. And we have to all work together through membership to encourage the development for those that are hesitant or resistant. The go-to interventions to improve vaccine hesitancy in an individualistic world generally include fear appraisals, using behavioral incentives or disincentives, and social norms marketing. If you get a chance to deeply communicate with someone, helpful interventions might include guided reflections on their personal moral development, or perhaps even encouraging them to reflect on their personal responsibility to other members in the human race during a pandemic. Even short interactions with people you do not know very well can be used to correct misperceptions, such as helping someone search information on whether or not the vaccines contain a live virus, which they don't, Many people just need simple things, like to know which vaccines can be found at which locations. They may need a ride or a babysitter, but simple things will help. Good members will help other members to be safe. The saddest part of the story is that what is done is done, and we could not go back and save the 5 million plus members of the human race that we have lost since the start of this pandemic. But we can do our best to learn from our mistakes so that we make sure the human response to pandemic is better next time. We know that governments must have clear policies and practices that are enforced with equity and transparency. We know that what individuals do impacts the human race as a whole. We owe it to every human being that lost their life to COVID to make sure that we work in membership to protect human life in this world that supports it. Phew, that seems like quite enough learning for one lesson. Thanks for listening. Just to wrap up and help do my part to circulate the tapes, how about we watch Quarantine Not Quarantined again? This time, let's think about the membership perspective. I will also bring along some friends to help make this more fun. Morning cat lady alert. Hey, don't forget about my plants. <laughs> We all got to do what we got to do to get through this quarantine, y'all. <laughs> mm, right. Reading. Plants. Music. Games. Going up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is about two friends going on an adventure, but COVID, so we had to use our imaginations. How dare you two not invite me? Uh, you're so obtrusive, Dr. Math. No. <laughs> Downtown Nashville was struggling through COVID, y'all. Everyone on that block was in your COVID membership grid. You know, that's right. I want to be touched. I know. Binaries, though. Yeah, for prediction and control. She's got you there, Dr. Math. Hush, I like this part. Mm-hmm. Your 
Do we really need the binary, though? It's tradition! It's been helpful in the past, but it may not be best for the future. <laughs> I'm scared. Aww. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. Ah. You two relax. Yes, the masks are creepy, but this is about keeping everyone alive and well. Well, that mask won't stop anything. Now I'm scared. <laughs> oh, you improper mask wearing lady. Take that. Here's the truth. Yes. Oh, Tom Hop, this ain't our first pandemic. Nope. That's right. Yes. Okay, okay, that was fun. Breaking down the binary doesn't have to be scary. We may feel alone, but we always exist in membership. I get it. I've just been trained to be an individual. The membership perspective doesn't change who you are. You just have to care about your impact on others. We're all happiest when everyone is safe. Agreed. And kitties. Kitties, kitties make us all happy. Kittens. Ah. Oh. Kitties. kitties. I love cats. Meow. Now I think I need a nap. <laughs> I could use a nap too.